Welcome to Meet the Author, where you can join in on insightful conversations with best-selling and award-winning indie published authors. Your hosts today are Rob and Joan, who themselves are indie published authors, book publicists, and paranormal investigators with Tampa Bay Spirits, based in Tampa Bay, Florida. Thanks for dropping by. And now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Joan. Whether you're watching this live or if you're watching it at a later date, or if you're listening to it on the podcast, we're really glad that you decided to join our audience tonight. Yes. Welcome aboard. A um, couple things to cover first. Uh, first is uh, right after this show, um, we want you to join. We'd like to invite you to join Voice of Indie podcast on blogtalkradio.com with uh, host Beam Weeks and Gary G's. That's every Wednesday right after the show. We don't, this is a pre recorded show. So uh, we don't know who their guest is going to be um, at this point. So, but tune in. They're going to be wonderful, I'm sure. And then uh, this coming Saturday, uh, May 6th, expect uh, on episode rewind at uh, 5 30 p.m. Eastern Time, right here in the U.S., right here where you're watching right now, we're going to have uh, a replay of the 2022. Magnolia Bluff uh, Reveal Part 3, <laughs> and that's episode 77, which is really good timing because next Wednesday night uh, live uh, is the 2023 Magnolia Bluff Reveal Part 2 for 2023, and our guests will be Richard Schwent, Caleb Pertle, and Cindy Davis, so that's going to be a good time. Um Katie McNiven won't be able to make it. She's also should have been spotlighted, but we will talk about her book as well. Um, also coming up the weekend of, I believe, May 12th is the Rochester, New York Parafest. So you want to check that out if you're in the Rochester, New York area. Be a lot of uh, paranormal stuff going on there. Yeah. So uh, without. And, and don't forget, on the last Thursday of every month, we have a paranormal podcast that's right every uh last, last thursday, thursday of each month at is, 7 30 uh, the haunted campfire tales uh presented by tampa bay spirits.com yes tampa bay spirits one.com yes to be specific <laughs> yes okay so we wanted to introduce our guest yes without any further ado let's bring maureen dixon on hi maureen hi maureen, hi, maureen. Hello, man. pleasure to be here Oh, we're so glad to have you. Thanks for being on. Now, you've written a book called Pirates, Pilots. Pilots. Not <laughs> pirates. <laughs> no, pirates. pirates it, it, she's written about the Caribbean, so you have to forgive me. <laughs> it's Pilots and Soldiers of the Caribbean, Fighting Men of the Caribbean. Yes. Um, and it was interesting to me how you came about to write this story. Would you like to share that with the audience? Yes. Um, my father at the time was terminally ill and I, I suddenly realized that I hadn't had the conversation with him about his childhood. Although I was born in British Guiana, which is in South America, uh, it does face the Caribbean and we are included with them for cricket actually. And uh, however, I, I realized that I hadn't had this conversation with him and he started to have Alzheimer's and so I realized that I had a, just a, a small window of opportunity in which to have the conversation about his childhood. And one of the questions that I asked him was, what did you do in the war? Of course, he was far too young to be in the war. In fact, he was 18 years old when the war came to an end. But he was able to tell me what was going on in British Guiana at the time, which was a reflection of what was going on right across the Caribbean. Um, for instance, um, Britain was importing things like um, demerara sugar, cotton, um, bauxite, which was actually aluminium. They turned that into make planes and flour. Uh, so that meant that the people of Guyana um, didn't have those commodities in which to use themselves. So instead of making bread with flour, which now they didn't have, they had to use um, a root vegetable called cassava which was actually poisonous. So you had to know exactly how to cook it. And some people did fall foul of it, but they used that to make bread. Um, they couldn't make cotton shirts or cotton dresses because 
all of that was uh, sent off to England. So they had to use um, khaki, which some of you might know is quite a thick fabric and not really conducive to summer dresses and shirts. So they did actually have to go through that. And of course they had um, food stamps and books and things like that, which was the same thing that was happening in England. So that I found that really quite interesting. And that's what really sparked me off into looking into that side of things further. He was, now we're talking about World War II. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but you've also written about World War I in your book. Yes. I felt that you couldn't really talk about um, Caribbean pilots and navigators without including World War I. Um, because there was a difficulty in World War II in actually becoming a pilot or a navigator because Britain just had the colour bar and everything else and that was going on. But there were a few pilots, etc., in World War, sorry, in World War II, but there were some in World War I. And I thought it was important to include them to show that they were willing, even at that time, to actually join in the forces and to stand beside Britain. And even though they weren't treated well in World War I, they were still willing to come back in World War II and fight again. Um, so the, a color bar for our American audience means they weren't allowed to fight because uh, they were not white. Yes. I mean, I think it was um, it's much more subtle in England from the point of view there was not um, an out-and-out -out segregation um, well, it was. There was in the army ma manuals things that said, you know, um, that people of colour should be discouraged from joining. And those who did join in the army in particular, um, they would have a letter D put at the end of their medical record. So by the time they went through the whole process and the medical record had this D, it was noted by the person who would say yay or nay, whether they can join, to say no. Wow. Um, Wow. So that was all be before 1939. After 1939, uh, King George V became really concerned because he thought he was going to lose the war, basically. And uh, he'd lost a lot of people at the Battle of Britain in 1940. So this colour bar was lifted because basically it said you couldn't join unless you were of European descent. Wow. So that's how it was actually enforced. Yes. Yeah. And if you look at if you look at the, the men who actually were pilots and navigators, they're all very fair skinned. So there was a lot of funny business going on in regards to that. Right. Right. For people who could pass. Yeah. Yes. yes. <clears throat> yeah. Well, in World War Two, we had the Tuskegee Airmen here in mm -hmm. uh, the United States, but they they came up against a lot of prejudice. Also. Yes. I mean, they weren't mm -hmm. stopped from joining, but there was a lot of pre prejudice against them. Yes. And that's too bad. Yeah. And even today, if you go to the War Museum or if you go to um, one of the memorials, you know, it'll have all the, the pilots or navigators or soldiers' names there on it. And um, I went to the um, Commonwealth um, Memorial um, gravesite, and there was nothing to indicate that there were people of colour there. So I wrote to them and I said, look, you have a room and it has pilots and navigators and they're all white and there's no person of colour in there and it's supposed to be a commonwealth. Where are they? So it took about two weeks, but eventually they allowed me to put a photograph in there of a, a black Spitfire pilot of World War One, James Hyde. So, wow. um, yeah. Good for you. Only took, only took no, two I'm, weeks. That's I mean, good. that's amazing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Wow. Aren't you proud of yourself? <laughs> well, at the time, I didn't. I didn't look at it as whether I was proud or not proud. I was looking at it. I was a bit annoyed. I, I just thought that it wasn't. It wasn't right, and I just wanted it right. to be correct. Right. Yeah, okay. you were a bit annoyed, so you did something about it and yes. started complaining about it, and then it happened. I think yes, that's so. right. Yes, Something to did. be proud of for sure. I yeah. agree, a hundred percent. Yeah, let that be a cautionary tale, people. <laughs> if you're annoyed <laughs> about something, if something's wrong, you yeah. can do what you can do the to change that's things. Yeah. That's right. That's, that's that's really amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I I noticed that you said that you've traveled then to the Caribbean. Oh yes, um, because I wanted to actually 
get the stories from whoever was left from World War II that I could, um, because there's a tendency in the Caribbean where parents don't talk to their children about their past. You know, we are expected to be seen but not heard, basically. It's a very Victorian sort of manner that most of us were brought up in. And um, so we tend to lose that bit of history, lose that little bit of what, what was going on. So I wanted to actually go and, and talk to people about it. It was a bit difficult at first because a lot of uh, men who fought in World War II who are still alive, they don't talk about the war because they were never felt made to feel that they were recognized or that they were appreciated. In fact, you know, they weren't recognized when they went into the service, when they were in, in the service or when they left the service. For, for people who didn't come back, people who died, they basically died believing that they were fighting for democracy, not just for England, but for their own country of, of birth. But then for the people who survived and came back, they had to live with the fact that they weren't recognized and they weren't acknowledged for what they had done. And worst of all, they were just airbrushed out of history. So it was important that I spoke to as many people as I could to get their version of what actually happened. And then they would talk to you? Yeah, eventually they would. They wouldn't at first, but eventually would. Once I was able to explain how important it was, you know, mm -hmm. to our children and the children and not just to people of color but to everyone you know we can't understand each other if we don't understand history and history belongs to everybody you know mm -hmm. so it's important it, it's what we should be learning from right yes yeah we not to repeat past mistakes you know yes. and to know the truth about what our yes. history is not have it be all cleaned up and tidy and presentable yes. have it be the raw truth yeah i agree mm -hmm. My dad was in World War II, and um, oh. he wouldn't talk about it either. Yeah, my dad <laughs> for, too. Yeah. And yeah, your dad didn't no, talk about it no, either. Not a word. Oh, okay. But he went out and put his American flag up every day. You know, every, every day, every oh, day yeah. of his life until he died. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And wow. he uh, he did talk to us a little bit towards the end, but not a, not Very a lot. lot. And then, right. uh, then we found all these letters that he wrote. <laughs> yeah. And all his yeah. Yeah. all his yeah <laughs> his dad his dad was a really good man <laughs> but the, they none of them that came home i think talked about it right oh dear sorry about that <laughs> okay time's up i have the same alarm <laughs> yes i have the same song for my alarm so we know what oh, that dear. is That's okay yeah <laughs> We'll start doing that for our commercials. We'll oh. put a little alarm. Yeah. Oh, time for a commercial. That's a good <laughs> <Yeah>. idea. <laughs> but yeah, I think uh, that's great that you were able to get them to talk about their stories. And what did they tell you? Well, actually, I was quite surprised in um, Trinidad. For instance, there is Ulrich Cross, who I'll show you a photo of, of him, actually, if you can see him. It's him here with Prince Philip. Okay. Yes, we do. We see him. Uh -huh. Yeah. Ulrich Cross is the most decorated um, Caribbean pilot there is of the Caribbean. And he came from Trinidad. And I went over to Trinidad to interview him at one point and also to interv uh, interview some other people. And he, he was fine, but some of the others, they, they weren't interested from the point of view that they knew that they weren't treated well by the British during the war. And Trinidad now has oil and is quite independent and it's, it's quite a wealthy country now. And they didn't really want to talk about it. They weren't interested in the war, which was, um, I found that a bit of a blow actually, because yeah. <laughs> I was writing about it. Um, they didn't so much want to talk about it. A few of them did, but a lot of them didn't want to talk about it because they didn't see that it was that important to their history because they were not appreciated and they were not recognized. And so they sort of turned their back on it a little bit. So that was um, that was quite interesting. Yeah. Um, some of the others um, went to St. Lucia and I spoke to people there, et cetera. And um, as I said, they weren't willing to talk at first, but afterwards they did. One of the things was that when they left and they came to Britain, 
they thought they'd be able to fight shoulder to shoulder with their comrades and of every color and that that would be the situation but that wasn't the case in fact they found themselves in um, labor companies and these labor companies meant that they had to dig latrines had to become cooks things that growing up they would never you know be forced to do and um, and also be butlers to their, their white commanders and, and officers and um, they found that really quite unacceptable um, so I think that's part of the reason that um, they didn't talk about it so much but one the one thing that ran through it all was that they were all happy and proud to have served you know that was important to them that they did serve they stepped up to the plate and they served and they knew what was going on they knew that they could die i mean what the germans did at the time of world war ii is they stationed submarines outside the um the west indian harbors in order to blow the merchant ships up because they knew that the british were importing all these goods and that they'd have to go through the caribbean shipping lanes in order to get to the atlantic so to stop that trade and that transport, they would actually put U-boats outside of these countries to blow up the ships. And one of the ships that was blown up was carrying the father of Gary Sobers, the cricketer. You know about the cricketer, Gary Sobers? You don't know about Gary Sobers? No. Well, he's a very famous cricketer. And um, his father was blown up because he was a merchant sailor and he was on his way to uh, Britain to join up with the army. And um, so he died in that situation. Wow. So a lot of merchant Marines lost their lives too. Oh yes. To yes. get goods to England, to England. Yes. for the yes. war effort. That's right. And oil from Venezuela as well, because they were also importing oil from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> back in the day. Well, you know, it's, so, it's curious because when people think, you know, um, about the West Indies and they think about World War II, they don't, they don't know how what the connections are and how they were connected in that war. And they unless you tell the story, they don't understand that there was a connection, you know. And in fact, lots of them did die also during that period of time. And when you think about how small some of the Caribbean islands are, and they gave money, they gave planes. Jamaica gave, I think, two planes, you know. Um, Guyana gave, um, you know, um, rum, they gave, as I said, all this flour and all this other stuff. They all gave something, you know, they all sacrificed something. So that's why it's so important that we know the history and know their involvement. Yeah, we've yeah. been to the Caribbean. We know a mm. lot of the company, countries are not wealthy countries. No. no. Yeah. Well the people, yeah, the people work even hard, today. and even today, yeah, yeah, yes, yep. yes. yeah. If you go there on a cruise ship, don't just stay on the outside rim of the the island. Go into the interior, yes. and see people. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I've been on two cruise ships, and unfortunately, I've seen a lot of people. They just hang around outside the ship, and that's it. You know, which is terrible, really. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to go to a country, you should try to embrace what's there. You know, mm -hmm. right. and you can only find that in the interior. <laughs> that's right. Yes, <laughs> the the outside of the island all looks pretty, and you know, yes. built up, and you get on the inside, and you see what's going yeah. on. Yeah, yeah the people are but great. But then again, it's in every country, you know. Um, Britain Absolutely. has its areas that are not so wonderful. America <laughs> has its areas that are not so wonderful, you know. <laughs> but it's a way of learning about people, you know, to see what the actual people are doing and yeah. how they're living. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yep, exactly what's happening. Get a well-rounded picture. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, it's time for us to take our first break. And okay. when we come back, we will continue this conversation. It's very fascinating to me. Yep, but we're going to have a word from our sponsors yeah. first. So, don't go away, folks. We'll be right back. Mystery hovers in the Magnolia Bluff Public Library. It has nothing to do with the hundreds of suspense novels on its shelves. Caroline McCluskey is the librarian. She finds a crimson hat and a black and white poodle puppy. They belong to Esther Williams. Esther is missing. The police can't find her. Neither can the FBI. Esther's only hope is a ring of three women investigators 
who form the Round Table. The Round Table has already solved one mystery in town, but this time, a woman's life is at stake. The Doggone Diamond Dilemma is now available on Amazon. They thought the siren was dead. In the novel, Siren Song, by author George Dismukes, James Harmon shot her twice. Several people saw her dead body sinking slowly into the abyss. But now, in Siren Song 2, evidence suggests that she may still be alive. She killed that boatload of people. It was her! She's just getting started. Benji, that's impossible. The cold chill up my spine tells me it's not impossible. We've got to start all over again. And this time, do it right. Siren Song 2. The story continues. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and many other bookseller websites. Get your copy today. The clock is ticking. Can Gracie uncover the truth? Philip Pliant is the wealthy opportunist plastics dealer and CEO of Pliant Industries. He's also a master thief, creating a pervasive threat to the manufacturing infrastructure in the Caribbean islands markets. With the cartel as his stealth client, the naive city leaders have been seduced, enabling the production of more than three-dimensional building materials. The expected profits are monstrous. Is the R group? Now led by Gracie and the family heirs, strong enough to win against this predator? Can JJ's cats act on the root cause analysis in time? Will Gracie be able to squash Pliant and the cartels? Gracie never considered their lives would hang in the balance. The clock is ticking. Five, four, three. And we're back. <laughs> And I forgot that book took place in the Caribbean. I did too. <laughs> so let me just put this up again. Here's the cover of your book, Pilots and Soldiers of the Caribbean, Fighting Men of the Caribbean. So this is a, a nonfiction, true story of actual people that lived through this. I can't mm -hmm. even imagine how long did it take you to research and get all of these stories together well it actually took six years i know it sounds a long time <laughs> well i'm not surprised that's, that's a long time yeah, yeah. yes it took six years and it was a quite a turbulent time really because originally it was going to be a documentary and i went to all of the various television channels um to pitch it basically and right. one of them said to me, um, we're not doing black at the moment. <laughs> yeah. <I> said, okay. <laughs> and uh, that was very telling. Well, considering that today, everybody is doing black, okay? But that's what he said to me <laughs> at that time. <laughs> that's what he said to me at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but there was one uh, channel, the History Channel, who said that they would do it. And in fact, they... Um, put me in touch with a production company and we started to work on it. But unfortunately the production company said they wanted more money because they wanted to do reenactments. And yes, it would have been great for the story, for the book, but it meant that the 45,000 that they'd given us to actually do it wasn't enough. So the director went off to France to raise some more money to do it. However, unfortunately on his return, he was made redundant. So that wasn't, going to happen on that occasion. Although they did come back to me and they say, well, we will do it, but we want an expose. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? And they said, well, Johnson Bahari, VC, um, he smoked pot when he was, you know, in school. And I said, well, no, I don't think so. Because I can never, I cannot remember the time that we had um, an English person who fought in the war on television, talking about what happened to him during the war. And then he says, oh, well, you know, I smoked pot when I, when I was a teenager. Never. So I said, well, no, that's not going to happen. So I walked away from it, in fact. And, 
and I decided to write the book. So it wasn't because I was an author before or particularly thought about writing about it. It's just that I wanted to get the story out there. And that was the only way I can think of getting the story out there. And worst of all, I was also, I am also dyslexic, so that didn't help a lot. So it, it was a lot of trial and error. <laughs> and, um, but I was determined to get the story out. And uh, so that's really how that came, how the book came about. Yeah, I don't think people realize, because we haven't talked about it, that you have been on TV and you yeah. have produced shows. And so mm -hmm. that's where you came from, which yeah. is... The opposite of most authors, most authors are authors, and then they get into the production yes. of uh, having their book serialized or, you know, made yes. into a movie. Yes. In my role as a realtor, I took people from Britain to Florida and um, helped them to purchase homes either for, you know, investment properties or for, you know, long uh -huh. you know, to live in basically forever. So um, it was a lifestyle, basically, I was selling opposite to what we have here, which is a bit cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have, you to, thank, we have just, you to thank for all the people that are here now. I was, yeah, I was, so. <laughs> I was say, we have heard of blame. Oh, blame. Well, no, I was going to say thanks. So I said thanks. Especially in Orlando, so many yes. European oh people have investment yes. property in That's Orlando. I mean, even I had a property there at one time. I, know. I mean, seriously. I mean, this we know. We were pass holders at Disney for many years. And yes. um, we haven't had a pass there for the last 10. But for over 20 years, we were pass holders. Wow. And yes. um, if we wanted to stay in town, <laughs> we couldn't rent a and b unless it was owned by a European. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Was crazy. really crazy, yeah, that's, and that's how we found that out. Not just there, though, too, along along all the beaches. We yes, a yes. lot of British people have invested in yeah, they have property there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, I don't know if you're familiar with Flagler Beach, but no, not really. No, it's near my, my farming area was basically um, Orlando. I did when I did the television programs. We did do um, Daytona, and we did do Tampa as well. Um, but only as, you know, like a one-off, we went and we filmed there because I had a client who wanted to buy in that area. Yeah. Well, St. Actual... Augustine is north of Daytona and Flagler yes. Beach is in St. Right. Augustine. Near St. Augustine. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. And so we rented a, a property there on right on the ocean. It was beautiful, right. but it, they were European owners. Yeah. Then. I think the market did take a dip after a while and a lot of people actually did pull out after a while because it did take a bit of a bashing, you know? Yeah. I wonder if it's gone back up now. I don't, I don't know. I think it's creeping back up, but I think you've got other countries like the Danes now are taking over more that are buying <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. So, Still European, I know. <laughs> Still European to us, yes. Yeah. Here, look. Um, yeah, let's how, get back many, to this. How, how yes. many uh, interviews would you say you did? Do you know? Wow. You yeah. Good so, question. Look. Yeah. Oh, about about fifty or sixty, I think. Wow. Not all are in the book, of course, because you know you have to get to a point where you have to say you have to stop. Otherwise, you will just keep going and going and going, and you will never finish right. the book. You know, yeah. you can always do a serial, a, a, a serial. Yeah, part two or something. Yeah, yeah. To, the, to the book, yes. But uh, you can't put everybody in. Right. Oh, that's a lot of interviews. Yeah. Wow. And the Army uh, were very um, helpful, too, because they allowed me into um, on the Army bases, and they um, put together teams of um, cadets for me to talk to and ask you know, why they were joining and stuff like that. So that was that was quite good, quite helpful. Yeah. Wow. And also the RAF as well. So that sounds like you're making progress and getting things changed and viewpoints changed, yeah? Yeah. I've just done a, a presentation of the book um, at the invitation of the um, High Sheriff of Buckinghamshire and... Um, Thames Valley Police as well, they gave a, a talk on diversity while I was there. And from that came other um, invitations. So I'll be doing one at the uh, Buckinghamshire University next month 
so that's that's been quite good and people say oh well you know why the police and i said well the police of all people they need to know the story because you know they just need to know you know who they're dealing with and what the stories were and that these people they actually did contribute to the country so that's important yeah it's important for, for people to see we're more alike than we are different yes yes you know absolutely and, and the other thing is that you know you're always hearing people say um well there are no role models you know maybe there are no black mole ro role models but there are lots of black role models it's just that they are not discussed and this is the problem we need to talk about them more so that the children of color and and white children also can see that they are role models there you know yeah 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 even today, do you find that in England? Because it's not that way in the United States. There are plenty of very influential role models that are people of color in the United States. Well, I'm not saying that they're not, the, the people are here. They're just not talked about. Really? Especially, it's, yeah, especially in the war. You know, I think there's, there's a, I don't know, it's a misconception. I think people are always thinking about people who you know they can run fast or they're sportsmen or you know they're a film star or what but there are there are other role models also absolutely and yeah this is the thing. you know at one point there was um an african businessman who owned gatwick airport gatwick airport is one of the biggest airports that we have in britain but how many people know that do you know what i mean oh. so we need to get these stories out this is what i'm trying to do to let people oh yeah 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 there, oh i think that our mailman we yeah. have mm -hmm. arrived because our oh, dog right. is heralding it he's, right he's now it. <laughs> sorry about that that's all right and she'll quiet down after a bit yeah i think that you know there's inventors scientists you know yes like you said businessmen politicians yeah. um you know medical field and me yeah doctors yes. You know, all kinds of people yeah, of all yeah. different colors and ethnicities and backgrounds, and they're all important. Yeah. And and also in the past, you know. Um, oh, definitely. You know, you, but the light bulb, it wasn't just a white person who invented the, white bulb, the light bulb. There was yeah. a black person who invented the filament, you know. So all yeah. of these things, we need, if we look back, we can see that there's always been this involvement, but just that. It's never spoken about, you know. Yes. The first heart transplant involved a black surgeon as well, but he's never mentioned. Yes. You know? so yes. Wally and Davison, two black guys actually started that up. Never mentioned. Yes. So it's important that we get to that yes. we look into these things. And say hello. <laughs> yes. <laughs> have you, have you not noticed history. this? Yeah. Uh, we're coming up on our next commercial here really quick, but um, I did want to get up your information while we're here. Let me bring it up. Okay. So if you would like to get in touch with Maureen, you can, oh, I just realized her name is Maureen. That's, yeah. We're writing a new book and the, the female protagonist is Maureen. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> the nickname is Mo. Is your name? Oh, right. My mother used to call me that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. One of my best friends growing up was Maureen, and we called her Mo. Oh, right. <laughs> so, anyway, Maureen's website is CaribbeanServiceman.com, and that's C A R I B B E A N S E R F V I C E M E N. Where did F come from. And if you're interested in, in getting a copy of the book, um, Maureen says she'll be happy to, if you go right to this website, you can buy it there and she will autograph it for you. She'll and sign send it, it out and to you. send it out to you. All right, cool. That's really good. And then on LinkedIn, you can find her under Maureen Dixon dash parentheses producer at Dixon Media end of parentheses. And Maureen spells her name as M-A-U-R-E-E-N-D-I-C-K-S-O-N. Her Dixon Media, however, is spelled D-I-X-S-O-N. So keep that in mind. On Instagram, you can find her as Maureen Dixon with the C-K spelling, Maureen Dixon 43. Her email 
is Dixon Media at yahoo.com. So that's spelled D I X S O N M E D I A at yahoo.com. Okay. I did. Let's talk about that one after the break. All right. We probably should. Why don't we go to the break now then? And yeah. when we come back, I have one more thing to talk about as far as getting in touch with Maureen. All right. Sounds good. All right. So everybody stand by. We have to do don't our. Don't go away. Give our sponsors their time. You need to take down that. Why don't we do that? <laughs> because that will be in front of the... <laughs> there we go. There you go. Easy peasy. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Stay, stay tuned, folks. First, there was Siren Song. Then, Siren Song 2. Now comes The Siren Hunter, a continuing saga about Angie Holland and her never-ending battle with the mythological denizens that are not even supposed to exist. Is The Siren Hunter a conclusion to the undersea horror? Only the sirens know for sure. The Siren Hunter, now available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and many other bookseller websites. Or contact this podcast, the trilogy is complete. People who like to read want to get their hands on books by Becca Jones. Becca Jones, the breakthrough author who tells it like it is. It takes courage to tell a story when it reveals dark secrets. Becca Jones delves deep into the hidden world of sexual abuse. She tells what happened and also tells how she survived. Meant to be is much more than just entertaining. Meant to be gives you a point of reference, hope to cling to, and becomes a guide for survival if you have suffered the same thing. Meant to be. Becca Jones. A must-have. Meant to Be is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and many other bookseller websites. Madison Jackson loved being a cop. A young girl is raped and murdered near Burnett Reservoir. Madison vows to get justice for the child. Madison travels to the heart of Mexican cartel country. She is kidnapped, tortured. Will Madison ever make it home? Justice by Kelly Marshall. Only at Amazon.com. Welcome back. Thanks for staying tuned. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. All right. So this is what I wanted to bring up is uh, Maureen has a GoFundMe. She's writing a story about women in the armed forces. And if you're interested in helping that come about, you can find her at gofundme.com forward slash untold dash stories dash women dash in dash the dash armed dash forces. That was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> now, what what made you decide to um, to do this for your next author project? Well, I felt that the uh, women who joined the armed forces are very rarely spoken about. And recently, I went to um, an army base called uh, Marham, and I met quite a lot of young women who were in the forces and started talking to them about why they joined, that sort of thing. And I thought, well, let's have a look and see what's out there about them. And there's, there is, there's lots out there about English, um, you know, women in the armed forces, but nothing really about black women in the armed forces. So I thought, well, there's a gap there. We need to tell that story. So that's how I started. 
But once I got into it, I, I became very interested in just women in the armed forces full stop. So that meant I had to go way back. And then it didn't just include black women, because, of course, there weren't many black women in the armed forces in Napoleon's day or, you know, in the Battle of Waterloo. So and it, their stories are very interesting. So I started with them. I went back that far and I started to look at their stories and the fact that a lot of them dressed as men um, in order to, to serve. And then later in, in American history, there were quite a lot of black women then who dressed as men in order to be to serve. One of the stories that really fascinated me was um, a woman whose husband was press ganged and taken off to Holland. And um, in order to find him, she dressed as a man in order to join the service to travel to find him. And um, she'd been in the service for about three years before she found out where he was and then actually found him. And of course he was living with someone else. So she decided to call that a day. <laughs> but what was really fascinating about the story, during her time, she'd had a duel with another man and killed him. Wow. So, she, so she'd been dismissed from, from that particular um, service and she went to another. And then she was accused of having a child with this woman. And so as not to be found out, she paid this woman child maintenance. Oh so my god! It was crazy. Well, <laughs> and what what time are we talking that about? Was in the 1600s, you know. In the but, 1600s. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that was uh, and and just doing the research is so fascinating, you know. Mm -hmm. And down to you know World War Two with the women from the Caribbean because the the colonial office didn't want them, the war office didn't want them. But then they decided that they couldn't do without them because they really were short of people, you know, to, to look after the soldiers and to do, you know, wireless work and everything else. So they had to let them in. But at the beginning, they didn't get the plum jobs. I mean, you know, the English girls, they got uh, jobs as land girls. And even today, that's a very respected and very prestigious uh, job to be to be a land girl, you know. And it took a while before they actually got good jobs. At the beginning, they were told they, they couldn't nurse white soldiers. They had to only nurse black soldiers. And then as time went on, of course, they were allowed then to, to do both. So they had a, a tough time. And the thing was, before they left the Caribbean, it was said they had to be um, well-mannered, come from a very good family, and be financially viable to pay their fare to come to England. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, I don't down, even have it? words. Well, yeah. I oh mean, who God. else has to say that? Yes. Who else? Well, has I, to I, you know, you have to. There, there's always another side because you know there there were uh, for every act of racism there was acts of of kindness and and people who cared about them and people who helped them. So there is a balance, but it was a it was a difficult time for them because when you think about it, you know, they were just coming to help. You know. So yes. to go through that, that was that was very difficult. Yeah. But yet again, you know, they they were the ones I've spoken to and, and read about, you know, they're always very proud of the fact that they did serve. And that's the thing, the service. It's like not saluting the uniform, not saluting the man, but saluting the uniform. That's yeah. what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the 1600s. I'm stuck mm -hmm. on that. I just <laughs> I just cannot imagine what that was like after she went to all that trouble. She yes. was in a duel, killed another person, was yes. acting as a man, was undercover as a man, so she could find her poor husband that she loved dearly and found him with another woman. Yes. <laughs> if that had been me, there might have been another duel right then and yes. there. You know? Or murder. <laughs> yes. um, straight up murder yeah. right yes oh my gosh that's that right there yeah. you should you should write a, a fictionalized story about that whole thing that would be a great story yeah. well there's they so much about her out there you know so it wouldn't have to be fictional believe me you know because she went through all of the different battalions <laughs> i mean that's amazing that's mm. amazing right there that's um 
Glad that you found that out. That's yeah. really interesting. Now, how difficult has it been and has it been more difficult for you to research things going back to Napoleon? Well, it is, it is difficult, but, you know, you just go to, you know, the museums, you talk to people there, you go to the records, you know, there are records, certain records that you can check. It's a lot of sitting down and reading through stuff, basically, because you yeah. want to get the facts right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you find it more challenging than... It is sometimes, the yes. First, the first book? Yeah. Um, in, in a way... It's different because with the first book, I still had some people that I can talk to. Right. Um, and and get the story. With this book, it's more research to write, you know, the, the 1600, 1500. It's more research. And but the facts are there. If you go to the library, etc., it's just doing the work, doing the research. Do you know what I mean? I love research. So it, it's, it's not a really a, a big stretch for me. It's just right. different. Yeah. Just yeah. different. Okay, cool. Yeah. A lot of authors do like research. I I I like research. I like yeah. research. I'm constantly researching everything. Yes. <laughs> Somebody tells me something and then I try to find out, well, is that yeah. accurate or is that not accurate? <laughs> I'll, I'll look it up. And just a side note here, uh, if and I just did it myself on my phone. If you go to gofundme.com and just use their little search thing all you have to put in, in is untold stories women and you're number one you you pop oh, right in okay. and then they can just hit that link so you don't even have to do the whole thing right just untold stories women and you're the first one that comes up women in the armed forces fantastic by Tom dixon so that okay. might make it easier for Thank somebody you. than yes. trying to remember the dash 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 stuff here yeah okay. yeah so when do you think you'll be finished with the, with this new book that's about the women in the armed forces? Well, I'm hoping I, I'm not planning on, on it taking me six years, another six years to, <laughs> <laughs> to oh <my> do that. <laughs> I'm hoping to um, have it all wrapped up by next year, the latest. Um, I could probably, yeah, I, I should think by next year, the latest, I'm hoping to have it done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I've I've had the experience now of knowing where to go and what to do. The only thing that would delay it is the presentations and people wanting me to do stuff because it does take you away a bit and you take your eye off the ball, you know. Yeah. Um, but I tend to work. I might wake up at two in the morning and I, I always have a pen and a notebook near to me because I get an idea and I have to write it down, you know. So then I end up with with a book full of notes, you know. Yeah, kind of yeah. yeah, yeah. I know. Um, my problem is then I can't find what it is that I'm looking for in my notes because yes. we just went through that this mm -hmm. morning. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you write, and I. The thing is, I find that the things that I write early in the morning sound better than the things that I write sometimes when I'm sitting down and saying, okay, I'll, I'm going to write for two hours or whatever. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 That's why you have to write it down when you get yeah. it. Because I think I that, so. that's your inspirational point, isn't it? You know, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And sometimes you'll dream it, you know, yes, that's right. Yes. Yep. And then you have to wake up when, cause if you don't write that down, when you wake up, it's gone. You lose it. Yeah, you do, you do oh, lose it. By the way, you have to write that yes. down. Yeah, it's it's strange, isn't it? But it's interesting mm -hmm. where inspiration yes. comes from. Yes, we meditate, and um, I think that that helps too. Oh, right. Yeah, because you quiet your brain down. <laughs> yes. Do you know? I'd like to um, read read to you a little bit from from the book. Oh, and we would love that. Absolutely. Yeah, and and it's about it's about Ulrich Cross, the person I showed you here earlier. Right. Okay. And Ulrich Cross. Um, I put it down here. Ulrich Cross um, flew eighty sorties over Germany instead of the twenty five or thirty that most people did. When you did twenty five or thirty you were then given a desk job because most people didn't make it after 25. And he did 80. Wow. He was shot down seven times and he survived. 
And after the war, he became High Commissioner to Trinidad and Tobago. He was Attorney General. Um, he was a diplomat. I mean, it just goes on and on. He was just an absolute, the quintessential Air Force airman, I should think, I should say. And I just found him absolutely fascinating. So someone asked me what my impression of him was when I first met him. So I'm just going to read you a little bit of that when I okay. first met him. Okay. I travelled to Chelsea for my first interview with Ulrich Cross. On arrival to my destination, I was ushered into a large, bright, sunny room where there stood a character of least, at least six foot tall. From his well-groomed hair and his press suit down to his shiny shoes, he was well presented. Ulrich greeted me with a warm smile, a handshake, and motioned me to sit down. How are you? He asked, immediately putting me at ease by the way he asked me the question. I was taken aback by his presence and how at 90 years plus, not only was he tall and distinguished looking, but how well spoken he was. There was an aura about him that could not be mistaken, a constant twinkle in his eye that told you that life was for living. He made you feel relaxed with every other word that he said. He laughed when he told me that in order to pass the physical to get into the RAF, he went on a diet of bananas and milk. Why, I asked. Well, because milk was considered to be the perfect food. One third carbohydrate, one third protein, and one third fat. And bananas are hermetically sealed. I don't know if it was the diet that got me into the RAF, he chuckled, but I got in anyway. After this interview, I met Ulrich Cross two more times. The last time I saw him was when I went to Trinidad just before he died to celebrate with him and others his birthday. His daughter Nicola laughed and joked with me at how in awe I was of her father. When I think of him today, I remember going to the Cameroon Embassy in Holland Park, where we went to collect a certificate for him. I told him that if he waited at the front of the building, I would call a taxi to get him home. As I was about to turn away, he took out a cigarette and lit it up. Ulrich, I cried, don't do that. Those things will kill you. <laughs> he stopped and looked at me. He threw his head back and gave out a hearty laugh stopped me in my tracks. What was I thinking? This man had done 80 missions over Germany under fire, shot down seven times and survived. As I walked away, I glanced back at him and said, as you were, we both laughed. That was my meeting with Owen Cross. That's beautiful. Wow. That really well is well really done. well written too. Yeah. Thank you. Made me cry. Made me tear up. <laughs> He's Thank nine you. years old and you're telling him to stop smoking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, that was very Never good. mind everything else he'd been through. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, he yes. sounds like he was really something. Like oh, he was. He was, you know. Yeah. And, um, and everyone loved him. I went to, um, they had a memorial for him in Eaton Park, and um, everyone was there, TV personalities, and everyone you can think of was there, you know, ministers. He was well loved, you know. He was a great man. And that's a role model. <laughs> that is Boy, a role that's model. That's for sure, right? <laughs> yes. That's in, in, many in many areas. In many areas. Yes. In yes. many areas. You can do anything. Except smoking. <laughs> Except for smoking, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't, don't follow that role no, model. No <laughs> not everybody is quite as... Uh, I'm not yeah. sure if we should all start eating bananas and uh, drinking milk now for yeah. our diet. Right, right. I mean, That's right. Although it might not lived, be a bad idea. You lived a long time. There you yes. go. <laughs> oh, dear. I want to remind everybody about uh, the book that she has out currently. It's Pilots and Soldiers of the Caribbean, Fighting Men of the Caribbean. 
looks fascinating, sounds fascinating. Mm -hmm. A lot of work went into that. Mm -hmm. It's their un untold, untold stories. stories. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes, it is. And that's that's excellent. Well, I still think you can produce it as a yeah a TV show or a yeah. movie. I mean, it's really maybe you can get a private uh, investment. Yes, I, I I did um a radio show uh, two months ago, and they were uh, building a studio actually, and they did say at that time that they would like to talk to me about actually doing something like that. So cool. there is yeah. a possibility, yes. Yeah. yeah. Possibility. So you're going to need a lot more money than $45,000. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <Gosh>. I know. <laughs> and it will, I think. Oops, you there we go again. <laughs> <laughs> go fund me. <laughs> or Kickstarter. A lot of people use that, too. I want to yeah. remind everybody the website for uh, Maureen is uh, CaribbeanServicemen.com. And you can purchase the book there and have it signed and sent to you. That's even cooler. Yeah, It's also available on Amazon if you want to go that route. Now, is it available uh, only on hardbound or uh, paperback or does it? Is there an ebook also? Uh, there is an ebook as well, yes. There is. Okay. So there it's is on, an ebook. In yes. all formats then, basically. Yes, yes. There is audio book? No. Is there an audio book yet? Unfortunately, no, not, an, not as yet, no. Okay. All right. Yes. Good to know. Good to know. All right, and then on LinkedIn, you can find her. Uh, just uh, just uh, search Maureen Dixon, and you want the one that's a producer at Dixon Media. But and that then, Dixon is D I C K S O N. Just right. want to remind yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, hers is on her name. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, also uh, Instagram is Maureen Dixon forty three. You can follow her there, and her email if you want to write to her and give her. Kudos, uh, Dixon Media at yahoo.com. That's D I X S O N Media. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we have the GoFundMe as well. Yes. So, do you have any other? Well, I'm just wondering like if you out? have any words for any people coming up behind you who maybe would look to you as a role model. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> well, I think um, that. If you're passionate about something and um, you should try to follow it through um, it's not easy sometimes you get downhearted but if it's something good and you are passionate about it then you should just try your best to uh, to reach your goals and even if you don't reach the top of what you're trying to do you'll get somewhere and I think it's important that you at least try and sometimes you get results in two weeks. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you hadn't done, if you hadn't done that, nothing would have right. happened. That wouldn't have right? happened. That's and right. that still is a mind blower for me. Oh, two weeks yes. later, they let you. I mean, I yeah. honestly, I cannot imagine that happening in any American museum. No. Really? Oh well, no! In two weeks? Yeah. No. No, you I might be able to get it done, but it's going to take months or years, maybe. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Oh, it wow. Longer if you, than two if weeks. you find the right person, you got to yeah. make the right connection. Wow. No, I'm yeah. very persistent. Lots of emails, lots of phone calls. <laughs> 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 when is a will? <laughs> well, I get it. They were shutting you up. <laughs> Why don't you put the picture in? There you go. <laughs> Persistence. That now, see, you should have mentioned that when you were saying. <laughs> How to get things done. There yeah. you go. Yeah. You don't give up. You persist. And the nice thing about that was that um, I was invited by the um, RAF about four months later to that particular uh, memorial. And someone there told me that they went into the room and they saw this picture of James Hyde. And um, it was decided that they should give a talk on him. And they actually did. So that was absolutely wonderful. Wow. Yeah, that's great. That's See, awesome. you're making a difference. You are yes. making a difference. I, and I think it's great that your military is open to hearing from you. Yeah. yeah. They're not trying they're to hide their mistakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that today, you know, the military um, are trying to embrace what happened in the past and put it right. Um, I've met some really interesting and really, really nice people in the military. And I haven't met anything or anyone that's been negative of late. You know, they're all trying to um, to put things right. So that's, that's really wonderful. great. 
Yeah. That's really great. No, we're, we're slowly getting there. Yeah. Well, believe it or not, we've been on the air for over an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I believe that went you. fast. Yeah, it did. So I want to thank you for joining us. Thank from, you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. From across the pond. Yes. As they say. And yeah. um, look forward to your new book when it comes out. Let mm -hmm. us know. Keep us posted. Okay. Yeah. I will do. Thank you. We can talk some more. Yeah, bring yes, it back. That would be lovely. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure Thanks being here. Thank, Thank you. you. And we're going to go over to the side here. Don't fall off. Okay, there you go. <laughs> that wasn't too painful, I hope. Um, okay, um, this Saturday, uh, May, May 6th, uh, episode rewind is uh, the 2022 Magnolia Bluff reveal part three for that series, episode 77. And next Wednesday, come in and join us uh, for the 2023 Magnolia Bluff uh, reveal part two. So the next uh, three books uh, in the series uh, by Richard Schwent, uh, Kayla Pirtle, and Cindy Davis. And um, do you have anything else you would like to talk about? I there? do not think so. Okay. Then I think we are done here. Until next time. That's all, folks. Thank you for joining us here on Meet the Author. Make sure you stay up to date with our show by clicking like, follow, and share. And you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and more. See you next time on WLFE-DV.com. You've been listening to WLFE-DV.com, where our shows are your shows.